Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's an honor and I am excited because it is the first time I will present this topic to the public and I combine two issues which are really important for me. The first issue is diversity and it is important to me because I was engaged in politics when I was a student and a PhD student and I was one of those who had to justify affirmative action and who had to defend diversity in the workplace. And it is great to tie on that and elaborate on that theoretically now. And I combine that with another topic which is really important for me because this is part of my PhD thesis. It's the philosophy of the Russian thinker Mikhail Bakhtin and more generally the philosophy in the beginning of the 20th century, especially phenomenology. And I will combine both and I hope it will work. And as mentioned, the value of diversity is an issue of politics. George Schill pointed out that the diversity argument is generally advanced by politicians and others with political agendas. But it is seldom formulated with much precision or care. Instead, political correctness tells us to value diversity, to respect and to support it. Thereby, diversity is postulated as a positive value itself. But what exactly entails the diversity argument then? Actually, there is not one such argument, but there are different diversity arguments. I will take a look at both political and philosophical ones. I concentrate on human diversity, and especially cultural diversity, which is ethnic, gender or religious diversity. I will rationalize the value of diversity with recourse to the epistemic difference principle which was invented by social epistemologists, and I will support their claims with a general analysis of the experiential surpluses of others provided by phenomenologists. To rationalize the value of diversity, we should ask first, what is diversity and what is a value? I argue that cultural diversity is a phenomenon which appears between us. Concerning the term humanity, Rolf Elberfeld mentioned that phenomena are no concepts, begriffe, but concepts are phenomena. The concept of humanity is such a phenomenon. Humanity is what appears to us and it appears as diverse. Therefore, diversity is a value, because values are not what we experience, but how we experience the world, as James Jihad pointed out. According to this, diversity in general is a value, because it is not what we experience, but how we experience humanity the natural environment, and so on. The question is, how to rationalize the positive value of diversity? And in the following, value of diversity refers to this positive value, if not otherwise stated. Unquestioned demands build upon the unquestioned value of diversity and the pressure produced by the political correctness doctrine are dangerous. The political demand to respect and to support diversity often simply disregards the problems and misunderstandings between different groups of people with different moral values. And in Europe, recently, this disregard led to a strengthening of right-wing parties who took advantage of the people's fears concerning cultural clashes. Here, political philosophy is in demand. 
a lot of political topics are discussed controversially, both in academic debates and in public. These include such cultural clashes or affirmative action, the policy of favoring members of disadvantaged groups. <coughs> In this context, some argue for the benefits of diversity, while others argue that diversity is harmful. But the positive or negative value of diversity itself as a foundation of these arguments seems to be nearly unquestioned. I would take those controversies, especially concerning affirmative action, into consideration. But first, I will address the seemingly uncontroversial foundation by looking at a less politically charged question. Therefore, I use an example which indeed seems to be absolutely uncontroversial. Or, can you imagine a political talk show with the topic, should we preserve the world cultural heritage or not? And so we come to politics and the unquestioned value of diversity. The UNESCO World Heritage Organization represents a well-known and seemingly uncontroversial approach, a political approach, which values human diversity. It is seemingly uncontroversial because we all might agree that, for example, it was good fortune that Kyoto was not destroyed in World War II and is now designated World Cultural Heritage. So, we are still able to walk the streets of Gion, visit Nihyo Castle, or the temples and shrines. But, how can we rationalize the value of cultural heritages as representations of cultural diversity despite the selfish interest of enjoying it. The organization's website tells that to be included in the World Heritage List, sites must be of outstanding universal value and meet at least one out of ten selection criteria, which are, for example, to exhibit an important interchange of human values on developments in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. But why are the heritages of universal value? Why is the interchange of human values important? Maybe we find an answer in the organization's founding document. It tells that the General Conference of the UNESCO founded the organization, considering that deterioration or disappearance of any item of the cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impoverishment of the heritage of all nations of the world. Recalling that the constitution of the organization provides that it will maintain, increase, and diffuse knowledge by assuring the conservation and protection of the world's heritage and recommending to the nations concerned the necessary international conventions. And considering that parts of the cultural or natural heritage are of outstanding interest and therefore need to be preserved as part of the world heritage of mankind as a whole. Well, this is a political argument, which philosophically actually goes like this. If the disappearance of any item of the cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impoverishment of the heritage of all nations of the world, and if the parts of the cultural or natural heritage are of outstanding interest, then they need to be preserved as part of the world heritage of mankind as a whole. The outstanding interest and the harm caused by its vanishing are the presumptions of this argument. They are mere postulates. But, and this is a heretical question, 
where is the proof or the convincing indication that the heritages are of outstanding interest? I do not mean a special heritage site, but cultural heritages as representations of cultural diversity in general. To ask some more heretical questions. Why shouldn't we just tear all the old buildings down and build new and practical ones? Or why is it not enough to preserve one temple in Kyoto and one cathedral in Cologne, Germany, and so on? Of course, I myself feel very uncomfortable just thinking or writing this. But feeling uncomfortable is no argument. Therefore, to find such an argument, we should employ a devil's advocate and ask the heretical questions, because otherwise we will be captivated by the political correctness doctrine. A devil's advocate in this case may be a 16-year-old fond of arguing, or a whole bunch of them. Imagine a school class visiting heritage sites. We might see a lot of bored faces instead of outstanding interest. And teachers and parents can tell how you can get into trouble when you try to rationalize the value, the outstanding interest in a debate with a bored 16-year-old, for example, in discussion about the next school trip. I can tell a story or two about that because I was working as a teacher in Berlin and I do remember those discussions. And they went like, why do we have to visit this boring cathedral? Why can't we instead visit the historical pedestrian zone with a lot of shopping opportunities, of course? Maybe some of you remember those discussions too. I do. And often, the final answer of the adult may be a resounding, because, <laughs> stop bothering me. <coughs> and somehow, that is the answer of the declaration too, so far. That is the way it is. The diverse cultural heritages are valuable. <coughs> if we would find an argument which might convince those 16-year-old devil's advocates, we might have found something to convince nearly anybody. So let us take this as the target. Well, I have to admit here that the World Heritage Organization brings forward another argument. I will come back to that in the end, but First, we should take a look at some philosophical arguments which address the justification of diversity. And so we come to affirmative action, which is kind of located between philosophy and politics. In applied ethics, the value of diversity has been discussed under the heading of affirmative action. Affirmative action is often implemented as a way of making redress to victims of past injustices. The discussion about affirmative action lasts for several decades now with peaks around political decisions. Nevertheless, the topic is still highly controversial. I will not discuss the controversy in detail, but I will refer the debates on affirmative action insofar as they appeal to the value and the benefits of diversity. The debates are related to cultural diversity because those who defend affirmative action claim that it is justified when and because it moves us closer to a situation in which the holders of every desirable type of job and position include representatives of all racial, sexual, and ethnic groups. The presumption of this argument is based on the liberal claim that we should guarantee equal opportunity. 
The benefits of affirmative action may refer to individuals or to groups of people who were treated unjustly in the past or to the society as a whole. Concerning the first aspect, for those individuals who are treated preferentially according to affirmative action, the benefits of such treatment seem to be obvious. Those benefits are the possibilities offered to the individuals, social and economic improvement. But there is also a possible reduction of stereotypes, which potentially leads to an improvement for all members of the group. And such a reduction of stereotypes and prejudices likewise leads to an improvement of the judgments of those who have held the prejudices. This might be an argument which defends the value of diversity and refers to the society as a whole. However, the beneficial effect of destroying stereotypes was denied because when less qualified members of the groups in question, for example, women or people of color, are awarded positions or contracts instead of more qualified non-members, men or white people, whatever that means. Stereotypes about members of the preferred groups may unwarrantedly reinforce, as George Hull pointed out. Well, I have two objections to this objection. Howe mentioned that it would be desirable to do empirical research in order to establish how beneficial or harmful affirmative action is likely to be. This is true, but such studies exist already and they give evidence for the possibility to reduce racial stereotyping and prejudice, for example, through competitive category activation. Therefore, different kinds of social categories have to be crossed. Categorizing two separate groups, an in-group and an out-group, into an inclusive subordinate in-group reduces intergroup bias. Similarly, making multiple cross-cutting social categories salient can lead people to perceive a shared social identity without group members, reducing bias. For example, assigning participants to mixed gender groups on an arbitrary basis reduces gender discrimination. That points to a reduction of stereotypes through crossing social categories like race or gender. And such a crossing of categories indeed happens when holders of jobs and positions include representatives of all racial, sexual and ethnic groups, as far as the colleagues in the workplace are perceived as in-group. And that, of course, depends on whether they are perceived as fellow campaigners or as competitors. If a company both supports diversity and improves the team spirit, the benefit of the affirmative action and the diversity it entails are likely to occur. This was my first objection, and now comes the second. Because secondly, the objection only applies to strict quota regulations, like 50% women no matter what which is not what I would prefer, and not to cases where women or people of color are treated preferentially if they are equally qualified. Anyway, the question about affirmative action always deals with the problem that the preferential treatment of one group mandatorily entails a non-preferential treatment of another group which then might claim to be treated unjustly. Strictly speaking, affirmative action faces two difficulties. 
Firstly, it might treat groups unequally and then might be criticized for the choice of one group over another, may be likewise disadvantaged, as Scheer pointed out. And even the group categorization, which is mandatory for affirmative action, is problematic. At least people outside the categories male and female, like transgender or intersex people, are discriminated against. And affirmative action, which aims to compensate racial discrimination, ironically, is impossible without the use of the discriminatory category of race. But the difficulty of justifying affirmative action is even more fundamental. Because secondly, affirmative action has to treat at least one individual unequally compared to another. Otherwise, it would not be affirmative action, but just the choice of one qualified individual over another. And so we come from the individual advantages which affirmative action entails to diverse viewpoints. to be compatible with the liberal principle of equal opportunity. The unequal treatment, the choice of one person over another, has to be the answer to another inequality. The disadvantaged treatment of the group which the now preferred person belongs to. Both inequalities are supposed to ennul each other. But for the individual, which is disadvantaged through the affirmative action now, this might not feel like equal opportunity. The core problem of affirmative action seems to be that it at least violates individual rights, as Joseph Lefebvre pointed out. However, I argue that this is not true. Imagine a profession with a male surplus and a position to be granted in that profession. And now imagine two persons who are absolutely equal in all their professional qualities, but one is given the contract because she is a woman. And only that would be an affirmative action. We might say that her being female counts like a professional quality. And this only seems to be as unjust as the opinion that men are better than women in mathematics, qua their being male, or better in parking a car, and so on. I argue that indeed being female may be a professional quality as long as this means being different. In a profession with a surplus of women, the professional quality of being female does not count, but it would be the opposite. A male perspective would bring a different and valuable viewpoint. And such diverse viewpoints are the benefit of diversity which Lefebvre focused though he still did so with the aim to justify affirmative action. And that is why his critics concentrated on his claim to promote aggressive affirmative action programs in different fields of professions. And they ignored at this point the possibility to trigger innovation through viewpoint diversity it seems promising to rationalize the value of diversity. Professions will be more successful in achieving their ends if their communities include those with disparate viewpoints. The greater the diversity in the community, the greater will be the disparity of viewpoints with which the profession is practiced, and the greater the success the profession will have in achieving its goals. The claim, the more the better, was attacked as well because it is bound by consistency to endorse further policies which they would likely prefer to oppose. 
For example, such a claim must consequently include the hiring of religious fundamentalists in most professions, because this indeed would add something to the diversity of viewpoints. That seems to be a good point. However, we have to notice here that in this critique a mingling of different arguments occurs. Lefebvre argued for the epistemic benefit of diverse viewpoints. According to Peirce, he claimed that the more diverse the views of the minds, the greater the chance of discovering more empirical truth about the phenomenon under investigation. But the reason why most of us would not appreciate a religious fundamentalist in our profession are the moral or political viewpoints this person owns, not the epistemic ones. Of course, the latter may be influenced by the former. Just think of racist tendency to employ conspiracy theories. But if a colleague whose political attitude I detest, for example a sexist, makes a good point or brings a good argument, should I not benefit from that? Lefebvre's claim is not the more the better, epistemically and morally, but the greater the diversity in the community, the greater the success the profession will have. The success in the profession is not identical with the moral obligation science has. Of course, we should not find empirical truth due to cruel and inhuman experiments with human beings. But we should distinguish between moral and epistemic aspects, between the epistemic insight that a hypothesis could only be proven through inhuman experiments and the moral claim to deny oneself the epistemic proof due to moral obligations. And likewise, we should distinguish between people's attitudes which we dislike and the value of their arguments. The question whether a possible epistemic benefit brought by a fundamentalist's viewpoint is worth the ethical implications his employment would entail is the second step. Before we can morally argue that the success in the profession is not worth the moral sacrifices, we have to define such success and those sacrifices. I will now focus on Lefebvre's argument for a general benefit of diverse viewpoints for finding scientific truth. Though he gave some examples, which by the way may be questioned, he did not elaborate further on that. I will employ arguments in social epistemology for the benefit of diversity and I will combine them with some phenomenological descriptions which support the thesis. And so we come to the epistemic benefits of diverse viewpoints and the insight that sometimes it takes a village not only to raise a child. Lefebvre argued that the epistemic benefit of diversity is the benefit of diverse viewpoints, leading to both finding the empirical truth and eliminating errors in science. Empirical truth is objective in the sense that its evidence is intended to be objective, in that it is not relative to individuals, cultures, ethnic groups, or anything else. That sounds like one truth may be announced through one voice, but in contrast, a plurality is needed. This ties on a general requirement towards knowledge we find in Immanuel Kant's critique on judgment. Knowledge and judgments, including the conviction related to them, have to be capable of being generally communicated. 
otherwise no congruence with the object would be due to them. They would be a mere subjective play of imagination altogether. The objectivity of a judgment can be proven through intersubjective verification. Otherwise, it would remain subjective. And therefore, according to Kant, we have to combine the first mode of thinking, free of prejudice, selber denken, with the second enhanced mode of thinking, thinking in the place of any other person or an der Stelle jedes anderen denken. Only then will we be able to get to the third mode of thinking, thinking self-consistently or thinking without self-contradiction. To think in the place of any other possible person means to search for possible objections. Such objections are found through a kind of thought experiment in the critique of judgment, thinking in the place of another. Likewise, they can be found through disputing with real others with diverse opinions. Remember the devil's advocates mentioned in the beginning. Diversity of opinion is an issue of social epistemology and it both presents problems and affords opportunities. The problem is that it is an obstacle to consensus, for example concerning the destination of the next school trip. The opportunity is the improvement of one's own opinions by drawing on the information or skills embedded in the judgments of others. The Kantian sensus communis was developed further into a political theory of common sense. Plenty of studies argued for the epistemic benefit of diverse approaches, viewpoints, opinions or theories. According to James Bowman, the liberative democrats generally argue for an epistemic form of Rawls' difference principle that good deliberative practice ought to maximize deliberative inputs, whatever they are, including the least effective. Bowman tied on that, but suggested an epistemic difference principle in which more precisely the diversity of perspectives rather than of opinions or values ought to be maximized. And such diverse perspectives are not reducible to any particular set of values or opinions, but are the experiential sources of them. He named George Herbert Mead's example of team sports as a good example of a multi-perspectival practice, respectively an example for the constitution of a common first-person plural perspective. If we compare a scientific community or a society to a team game, then all members are supposed to work towards the same end, to drive the ball into the net, to gain social welfare or to find truth. Only if all members agree on what to achieve, share the same definition of truth or goods, their differing perspectives will help to find the best way how to do that. While differing sets of opinions or values may indeed bring out diversity's negative side that produces potential conflicts, different perspectives do not defined as cognitive properties. The moral or political values defended by the fundamentalists mentioned above may be part of the problematic plurality of values, but this does not mandatorily minimize the value of his or her cognitive properties. We still might value his or her perspective. Bowman's common first-person plural perspective 
seems paradoxical. He gives some concrete examples of this paradoxical concept, like the case when patients occupy positions on review boards for the sake of improving experimental practices beyond a single point perspective of experts and make such evaluations multi-perspectival and more robust. This seems convincing. However, I argue that phenomenologists' general analysis of the experiential surpluses of others will support the social epistemologists' claims. The surpluses are wedded to experiential lacks. Many epistemologists agree that objectivity is relative. John Terry pointed out that science is not objective on grounds that every inquiry begins from a specific place, a specific time, and specific assumptions. Value-neutral, impartial, mechanical inquiry is a pernicious move. Bias infects the process from beginning to end. This is not a denial of objectivity, as it was proclaimed by postmodern thinkers, which defended an ontological thesis about multiple realities and a metaphysical thesis about multiple truth. Instead, it is the acknowledgement that contrary to the assumption of a world out there, there are as many interrelated and smoothly connected realities as there are kinds of oppositional consciousness, as feminist philosopher Sandra Harding put it. And these kinds of oppositional consciousness are biased. Therefore, Lefebvre argued that besides finding the truth through intersubjective verification, Science needs to eliminate errors through intersubjective falsification, as I call it. He pointed out that for a good scientific hypothesis, both creativity and an appropriate education are needed. Creativity is tied to the individual and subjective perspective formed through culture, ethnicity, sexuality, racial identity. This li these likewise form biases. But education too creates intellectual biases because it tends to eliminate intellectual diversity as the student absorbs the then conventional wisdom of the discipline. And this is necessary because scientific progress is impossible without specializing. And specializing means, uh, specializing entails biases in a most general way because to specialize means to focus on one aspect and to blind out the others. This partiality of both the scientific worldview and the worldview formed through our cultural background, the cultural impression or tattooing, as Professor Tan put it, are likewise an issue of phenomenology. Both are ambivalent. For example, the cultural impression makes it difficult to understand other cultures, like our mother tongue makes it difficult to understand other languages. Among other aspects, it is difficult to adopt other languages because we are not able to hear all sounds the human languages consist of. This is comparable to color blindness. We cannot perceive some sounds which other people do perceive. The difference is that we are all equally affected by this sound blindness. Of course, there are exceptions, people who learn several languages and speak them without any accent, 
I do not know such a person. But most of us are only capable to hear the 30 to 45 sounds which are used in our mother tongue. However, as a six-month-old baby, we all were able to hear all 150 sounds clearly. Why? Because we were not tattooed or imprinted yet. But also, we were not able to communicate yet. And this is where the ambivalence comes in. Our cultural impression blinds us to some aspects of foreign cultures and, at the same time, it is necessary to understand foreign cultures, as Professor Tani mentioned. We would have no concept, begriff, of culture at all if we were completely natural humans and thus could not understand any culture. We could not acknowledge an essential difference between a rocky desert and a rock gun. And similar to that, a baby can hear all 150 sounds. But it cannot acknowledge the difference between the words formed by these sounds. Besides the partiality of the culturally influenced worldview, there is the partiality of the scientifically influenced worldview. Edmund Husserl addressed the partiality of any perspective in general with his claim to access the phenomena free of prejudices for Meinungen. Those prejudices might be unquestioned everyday attitudes based on the general thesis or scientific prejudices. Scientific prejudices include scientific assumptions and hypotheses. We might say that they are a form of bias which is caused by education and the adoption of the conventional wisdom mentioned by Lefebvre. The phenomenological reduction aims to put those prejudices in brackets. This means within the phenomenological reduction, we aim to blind them out. We cannot delete them because we cannot ignore something once we acknowledged it. We can only hope to forget it or we can push it back to the backs of our minds. And we cannot blind out everything. Many phenomenologists agree that a complete avoidance of presumptions is impossible and that the aim is not freedom of all presupposition, but freedom from those presuppositions which prevent the appearance of the phenomena we seek. Mark Rather pointed out that the faulty descriptions which the phenomenological reduction tries to put into brackets might even have their own kind of freedom of presuppositions of a certain sort. For example, the success of doctors' clinical detachment in diagnosing and describing disease is, to some degree, attributable to the way it blinds her to the human experience of suffering and illness. This means a biased perspective can be a lack and a surplus. Whether it counts as lack or surplus depends on the context. The phenomenological attitude is appropriate for a phenomenologist or an epistemologist. But to put all scientific prejudices in brackets, which means to blind them out, would not be appropriate for a natural scientist whose research is exactly focused on those prejudices. And within private interpersonal relationships, which requires some emotional attachment, the doctor's professional attitude and perspective on other people would be no surplus, but a lack. And even within the professional context, 
such an attitude may be both a surplus and a lack. That is why the patients were involved in the evaluation process to make such evaluations multi-perspectival and more robust. Especially concerning human phenomena, as I call them, we are not able to see the big picture. This is because, firstly, we are no impartial observers, but involved since we are humans. And secondly, because phenomena generally cannot be observed and described like a strain of bacteria in a petri dish. I argue that human diversity is such a human phenomenon because it appears between us. And human cultural diversity is an intersubjective phenomenon which relies on both the plurality of human beings and cultural values and the special relation between them. This relation is characterized by a social ontological difference which leads to experiential surpluses. And these surpluses make up the value of diverse biased perspectives. So we come to the social ontological difference and the experiential surpluses. Many phenomenologists claim that there is a fundamental difference between the perception of myself and the perception of another. Dan Sahari pointed out that the second or third person access to psychological states differs from the first person access. But this difference is not an imperfection or a shortcoming. Rather, the difference is constitutional. It is what makes the experience in question an experience of another person, rather than a self-experience. The Russian phenomenologist Mikhail Bartin pointed out that the social ontological difference between us is tied to a corporeal difference, or more precisely, a difference between our living bodies, life. For a start, it is impossible to take another's physical place in the world. If we try to take the same place at the same time, our bodies collide, and thereby they make the distinct horizons, the matrix of our individual perception, physically perceivable. Taken an appropriate constellation, we could minimize this horizon's difference to a minimum, but one would have to merge with, with each other, become one single human being to eliminate this difference. The distinct horizons entail a permanent surplus of my perception and knowledge when faced with another. Since we can never take the same place at the same time, I will always see something which is invisible for the other. The world in the other's back or the other's face. Generally, I perceive my own corporal reality or Leiblichkeit very differently compared to the corporal reality of another. I perceive the other as a unit which is fundamentally formed or closed, while my self-experience is an ongoing, vivid process. I cannot perceive myself as a closed unit. But at the same time, I'm the only one of the two of us who can perceive the other as such a unit. The surplus concerning the other is at the same time a lack concerning myself. Or more precisely, I lack the perception of myself as a unit in the way another person does perceive me. 
For example, I cannot look into my own eyes like another can. Even when I use a mirror, looking into my own eyes differs fundamentally from looking into another person's eyes. Because at the same time, I am looking at me from within these eyes. Besides the fact that what I see in a mirror is always reversed left to right. My surplus and lack of perception is conditioned by my being outside concerning every other person and my being inside concerning myself. Only I can experience my mind from inside of it. And I can only experience my mind from inside of it. To illustrate that, we can imagine a utopian world in which one can dive into another's mind, like depicted in the anime series Ghost in the Shell. Even if we could do so, we would still not be able to perceive exactly what another person perceives. Neither would we be able to look into our own eyes, not like another does. The mind or ghost and the body or shell are separable in this utopian world. And most people have cyborg bodies, the shells, with only a few brain cells left, which carry their ghosts, their mind and personality. Through their cyber brains, this mixture of technology and human brain cells, they can connect with networks as well as with other people. That means they can read others' minds literally, like a book. So one person can dive into another person's ghost and look through the eyes of that person's shell. Unlike us, for example, the character of Major Kusanagi here on the right can look at her own cyborg body like another does through the eyes of a person whose cyber brain she has had, for example, the blonde person, because her own body is a foreign body, an empty shell which is only temporarily possessed by her ghost. However, she might see what another person sees when she dives this person's ghost. But she still perceives it differently because she brings her own experiences, her own personality and her own biases. And if she looks at her own cyborg body, she actually does not look at herself. That is the difference between body, in German Körper, or Japanese Buddhai, and the living body, life or Shintai. She can neither look at her living body nor experience her ghost from outside of it, like another does, because both is given to us only within lived experience, and even she cannot be outside this lived experience. Well, the whole idea of looking at one's own body through the eyes of another person is quite abstract and hard to imagine and therefore I decided to illustrate it a little by showing you some small parts of the first movie of Ghost in the Shell. Sorry, spoiler alert, I will show you the end of the first movie, so if you don't know it, I'm sorry, but I try to cut out everything that tells you the story. And I will show it um, the first time in the Japanese original with English subtitles and then I will show it a second time um, in the English translation and give some smaller comments on it. So, enjoy. Hajimeru.
何のためにあることを理解してもらった上で君に頼みたいことがある私は自分を生命体だと言ったが現状ではそれはまだ不完全なものに過ぎない最後に一つだけ私を選んだ理由は私たちは似た者同士だまるで鏡を挟んで向き合う実体と虚像のように。So he figured out, and it's a bit confusing because、um, the other body is a female body, but it's an artificial body, and it's possessed by kind of a male person, maybe, and this person speaks through a male voice, so we can distinguish them. And this other person figures out how to dive into her mind too. They kind of meet in the cyberspace and talk there to each other. But he also figures out how to use her body now to speak. So he speaks through her body now and looks through her body too. After you have heard my explanation, there is something that I will ask of you, Kusanagi. Now she looks at her, her body. Indeed, creepy, I think.、Um, so she looks at her cyborg body now. But you still haven't answered my earlier question. Why did you pick me? And now her body、Because、looks back at her. So this might be kind of what it might look like.、Uh, Looking at one's own body through the eyes of another. But I argue that Kuzanagi, who's now inside of this body, does not look at herself, we might say, because、um, her cyborg body is not really her body. And it's a really interesting question if she can perceive this cyborg, this artificial body, as we perceive our living bodies. It's an interesting question. But、um, anyway. Uh, we can say that it's not her body, it's、um, disposable. She can put it on like we put on our clothes, and she can buy a new one, like we new,、uh, buy new clothes. So、um, that is the reason why we can say she does not look at herself right now. But even if we imagine that we could switch bodies like that, for example, if I would switch now bodies with my husband, and I would look at my own body through his eyes, Would I look at myself in that moment? I argue that I would not because I would not be inside of this body in the moment when I look through his eyes. It would be more like looking at one's doppelganger. A person who just completely looks like me but is not me because I'm not inside in that moment. And therefore, it is impossible to look at oneself in the sense of one's living body from outside. Anyway, fortunately, we have no cyber brains and our minds cannot be hacked yet. But instead, we are always outside the others, like they are outside of us, mentally, corporeal, and physically. As Bakhtin put it, the ever present plus of my perception, knowledge, and ability concerning every other human being. Is based on the uniqueness and irreplaceability of my place in the world. Because in this place, at this time, and under these circumstances, I am the only one. All other humans are outside of me. And he mentioned that、uh, we, could, we could get rid of this, this difference between us if we would merge. And become one single human being. But even if we could become one single human being, this would not be useful because it would lead to an impoverishment. The lack of not being able to see the world in one's back or one's own face would remain. We would be able to look in only one direction. And lose the plurality of perspectives and thereby the surpluses which we could share to compensate our lacks. Only the difference between us 
makes it possible to achieve the first person plural perspective mentioned by Bowman. Though Husserl was accused of solipsism, we find a similar pluralist approach in the description of the other eye seeing better and clearer in his ideas. Only due to the difference between us, an eye plurality, ich mehrheit, may enhance my world of experience through their experiential surpluses, Erfahrungsüberschüsse. I perceive my environment and their environment as one and the same world, which is only aware for us in a different manner. Everyone has his own place from where he experiences the given things, and therefore everyone has a different appearance of things. <coughs> Also, the actual fields of perception, memory, and so on, are different for everyone, aside from the fact that even the intersubjectively shared parts of what is conscious are aware in a different manner, different kinds of perception, different degrees of clarity, and so on. This supports the feminist epistemologist's claim that there are as many interrelated and smoothly connected realities as there are kinds of oppositional consciousness. That there is one, not identical, but a shared world. The experiential surpluses of the other eyes enable me to get to that shared intersubjective world as the correlate of the intersubjective experience. This intersubjectively shared world of experience leads to the only kind of objectivity humans can achieve besides the self-sufficient objectivity of mathematics. Because there is not one objectively shared identical world due to the physical and socio-ontological difference between us. Since, according to Husserl, things are presented to us in various ways, philosophy should be engaged in precise description of these appearances, appearances in plural. And since everyone has a different appearance of things, only together we are able to nearly see the big picture and give a precise description of it. Phenomenology generally contributes to the fact that knowledge and variation have both objective and subjective aspects, with the objective referring to the extramental world and the subjective referring to the subject which knows and values. Both the objective and subjective aspects are correlative, but never reducible to one another. Intersubjectivity acknowledges these two aspects of knowledge and valuation. It forms the correlation between them without reducing them. And it reaches beyond the subjective statements without falling for the myth of a pure objectivity. In the case of an intersubjective enhancement of my judgments, a diversity of perspectives is valuable in itself. A rich intersubjectivity allows us to learn from our contemporaries and knowledge of other cultures and people's lives in the past affords us new perspectives on our values. This means that not only knowledge and scientific truth but also our moral values benefit from diverse perspectives. While diverse values may entail pragmatic problems, might be an obstacle to consensus, diverse perspectives do not. However, I argue that diverse values may be valuable as well. This is not the case if people's lives in the past, for example, including their moral viewpoints, are reduced to a particular set of values and opinions. 
the conclusion then might be that either everything was better in the good old days or worse. But if their moral viewpoints are not reduced to a particular set of values and opinions, but instead are examined with regard to the experiential sources of them, then the differing perspectives underlying the different values may enhance our perspective or cognitive properties, including our perspectives on our values. But what about the dark side? Well, sometimes we have to learn from the past and sometimes we have to learn from the present too. To put it pointedly, the epistemic benefit of diversity is the benefit of diverse biased perspectives. But biased perspectives are only epistemically valuable if they differ. Since scientific truth is objective in the sense that its evidence is not relative to individuals, cultures, ethnic groups or anything else, this objectivity is proven best if as many people with diversely biased perspectives as possible can agree on its validity. One example of an epistemic benefit of diversely biased perspectives is that of the female perspectives mentioned above. A female perspective is biased in the sense that it lacks what is special about a male perspective just like the male perspective lacks what is special about a female perspective, whatever that might be. And there are examples from both analytical feminist philosophy and phenomenology. Such an individual lack of perceptual aspects, which might be a general description for bias, is bound to a surplus of other aspects, as shown above. That is why being female might be a quality and a professional surplus as long as this being female makes a difference. And this is true for every aspect that makes a difference between two persons who cannot be reduced to someone of this race, this sex or this social position. The femaleness is only one aspect with which the person's perspective may improve an environment. Nevertheless, in a male-dominated profession, this might make a big difference. And this is where we can employ the last and somehow only real argument which the UNESCO brings forward for the value of diversity. This argument, interestingly, is not formulated as an argument, but as a task. The World Cultural Heritage Organization will maintain, increase and diffuse knowledge by assuring the conservation and protection of the world's heritage. The presumption here is that the heritage is present and conserve knowledge. And by conserving the heritages, we conserve such knowledge. It seems convincing that knowledge may be maintained, increased and diffused through the preservation and presentation of the heritages which humanity has left for us so far. Because knowledge of other cultures and of people's lives in the past affords us new perspectives on our values. I defend the epistemic benefits of diversity, the improvement of our judgments and the spreading of knowledge, like mentioned by the UNESCO, due to the social ontological difference between human beings and the entailed surpluses of perception so far. The epistemic benefits which a support of diversity entails for all of us might be a good argument for affirmative action besides the moral claim to undo the injustices done to groups of people in the past. But 
what about the fundamentalist? I argue that even a fundamentalist's perspective is valuable, though his or her values reduced to a particular set of values and opinions are not. To learn from the past means to learn from errors of the past too. Besides the world cultural heritage sites like cathedrals and temples, we can and we have to learn from the past by visiting memorial sites. These remind us of the dark side of human culture, like the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin or the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, which is likewise world cultural heritage. And the rich intersubjectivity, which allows us to learn from our contemporaries, might include such dark sides too. At least, a fundamentalist's biased perspective might remind us that we are biased too and that we should reflect about that steadily. And a fundamentalist may likewise be a devil's advocate in the truest sense of the word. Arguing with such a person might show me my weak points and blind spots and thereby improve my judgments and arguments when I try to defend a liberal claim against such a person. May it be the claim of the value of diversity. This improvement might not be worth accepting the moral implications which the hiring of a fundamentalist entails, but it is indeed worth listening to him or her. Not listening to them did not help. Maybe I would not be able to convince a 16-year-old fond of arguing that we should visit this cathedral because diversity is valuable. But I hope that I was able to convince some of you a little that diversity can be valuable. Thank you very much.